Good evening, this is Engineering Mechanic Statics. Once again, we're using the fifth edition of the Hippler text. So we left off um, in chapter three, and we were simplifying a system of forces and moments into a resultant force and resultant moment. Mathematically speaking, the resultant force is the sum of all the forces in a system. And the resultant couple moment of a system is the sum of the moments of all the forces about point O in the system plus the sum of all the couple moments. We work out a series of problems that reduce several forces, etc., in the system into the resultant forces and moments, respectively. So now we're gonna do that a, um, take that step a little bit further. Cause previously we worked and determined its resultant forces and moment about point O. So about a specific point O. Now we will be working to find the location D or some distance D of the resultant force, the line of action we shall say from point O. So let's take a look at an example problem. Example 317 in the text, page 133. Here the problem asks us to replace the force and couple moment system acting on the beam by an equivalent resultant force and find where its line of action intersects the beam measured from point O. So starting with the beam. Point O. We have a four kilonewton force here. A moment here, clockwise. One point five meters, one point five meters. We have an eight kilonewton force here, four point five meters. A certain distance from the beam of 0.5 meters. This is y axis, x axis. So we start with our basic work. So our resultant force x component is the sum of all our forces in the x direction. So this is equal to 8 kilonewton since force is in the positive x direction. 
we want the 3 fifths legs ratio. So it's 8 times 3 fifths kilonewtons. That's the only, the 4 kilonewton force is totally vertical, so it does not have an X component. That gives you 4.8 kilonewtons. For my Y component of my resultant force, it's the sum of all my forces in the Y direction. The four kilonewton sense is in the negative Y directions. So it's minus four kilonewtons plus the eight. And then we want the four fifths slope triangle ratio. This gives you 2.4 kilonewtons. So getting our resultant force or the I'm sorry, calculating the magnitude of the resultant force, square root of the x component squared plus the square root of the y component squared. Theta. So, to redraw that beam, once again, point O, that force acts some distance away from point O. And the angle of that resultant force, we calculated, where the line of action intersects the x axis, we said it's theta, 26.6 degrees. So where does the line of action intersect the x-axis or the beam? And that's the question. And that distance here, distance from point O is D. We'll term it D. Well, how do we solve it? Well, we know that in the initial setup of the problem, about point O, the four kilonewton force is vertical. It causes a moment about point O. And the eight kilonewton force, the vertical component, and the horizontal component causes a, a moment about point O. And we're given a couple moment in the beam as well, 15 kilonewton meters. So therefore, the equivalent resultant force must cause a, an equivalent moment to the to the its individual components about point O. So what I mean by that? Let's go to a fresh page. So the resultant moment about point O to get the sum of all the individual moments about point O. Now where the resultant force line of action hits the x axis is on the same is its x component then of the resultant force. We'll say the line of action passes through point O. So the x component causes no moment about point O. But the Y component of the resultant force does cause a moment about point O. And since the Y component, based on the angle theta, is, is in the positive Y direction, it will cause a counterclockwise or positive moment about point O. So the resultant force that causes the moment about point O is limited to the Y component alone.
So the y component we calculated previously to be 2.4 kilonewtons. But where does it act? Remember, it's force times perpendicular distance to get us the moment. And we said that distance, d, is what we were trying to find. So setting that up, we have 2.40 kilonewtons sometime, times some distance d is equal to the individual components that made up the resultant force and led to the, the overall moment about 0.0. So we know the 4 kilonewton force causes a clockwise moment about 0.0. So that would be negative. Ver perpendicular distance is 1.5 meters. We were given a clockwise moment of 15 kilonewtons, so we have to take that into consideration. That was given in the problem. The vertical component of the 8 kilonewton force causes a counterclockwise positive moment, so we have to take that. So that's 8 kilonewtons times the vertical component, which is 4 fifths, times the perpendicular distance, which is 4.5 meters. But the horizontal component of the 8 kilonewton force is some perpendicular distance away from the line. The line of action of the horizontal component of the 8 kilonewton force is some distance away from O, oh, and that's 0.5 meters, and it causes a clockwise or negative moment. So we cannot forget that. The horizontal component, slope triangle 3 fifths ratio, and the perpendicular distance is 0 0.5 meters. Solving that out and solving for D, get D 2.25 meters. Let's work another one. Let's look at problem 87 on page 139 in the text. Here it says the weight of the various components of the truck are shown. So I'm going to just draw a rough truck. Fifty pound force. It's a fifty five hundred pound force. And this is a thirty five hundred pound force. And this is point B, point A. This distance here is three feet. The distance here is 14 feet. And the distance here is six feet. And the distance here is two feet. Okay. So we're given these weights of the different components of the truck and then we replace this system of forces by an equivalent resultant force and then determine this location measured from point B. So okay, all these forces are in the Y direction only. So my resultant force is equal to the sum of all my forces in the y direction. And all these are in the negative y direction, so that's minus 1750 pound force 
minus 5,500 pound force, minus 3,500 pound force, resulting force is equal to negative 10,750 pounds force. So then that force occurs some distance, we'll just place it here, some distance here, the resultant force, and that distance is some distance D away from point B. So then, if we take the moment about point B, So the resultant moment about point B is the sum of all my moments in the system about point B. So we know the resultant force cause if we replace the system of components of forces with the one resultant force, the moment caused by the resultant force about point B is equal to all the individual forces, the moments caused by the individual forces in the system about point B. So, And like we said, we want to know where the line of action of that resultant force is applied. And that perpendicular distance is D. So the moment then about point B will be the resultant force times that distance D. So that would be minus 10,750 pound force times D, which is what we're looking for. And now the individual forces, the moments they cause about point B. So the negative 3,500 pound force. These are all negative because they're causing a um, clockwise rotation, right? So negative 3,500 pound force times the perpendicular distance from that to B is three feet. Minus the 5,500 pound force. Times the perpendicular distance from that to point B which is 17 feet. Uh, minus the 1750 pound force times the perpendicular distance from that to B, which is 25 feet. Two feet plus six feet plus 14 feet plus three feet. Solving that out for D, we get D is equal to 13.7 feet. That's the distance from point B where the resultant force is applied. Let's take a look at another problem. 388, same page. Once again, it's a very similar problem to the one we just worked. Instead, they wanted to specify the location of the resultant force about point A. I'm sorry, a distance from point A. So let's draw a truck again. Get the ground. Seventeen fifty pound force. This time, this is point A. This is fifty five hundred pound force. This is thirty five hundred pound force. Point B. The distance here is two feet. Distance here 
between the 5,500 pound force and point A is six feet. Between these two forces, the distance is 14 feet. And this distance here is three feet. So here, once again, they gave us the weights of the various components of the truck and they want us to replace it by an equivalent resultant force and specify its location, this time located from point B. So once again, all these forces are vertical. So my resultant force is the sum of all my forces in the Y direction. <clears throat> so that's all negative Y direction. So it's negative 1750 force minus 5,500 pound force Minus 3,500 pound force gives you 10,750 pound force. So this time, we're going to take it about the moment about point A. So my resultant moment about point A is the sum of all the moments caused by the forces about point A. So once again, this resultant force is applied, say, somewhere right here. And it's some distance D from point A. And we're trying to find that distance D. So... Since the resultant force is pointed down in negative y direction, but it's to the left of point A, it's causing a counterclockwise or positive moment about point A. So it's 10,750, 10,750 pound force times the distance D, which we're trying to find from point A, right? It's equal to all the individual moments caused by the individual forces about point A. Well, the 1750 force, 1750 pound, feet, pound force is to the right of point A going down. So it's causing it clockwise or negative, right? So it's negative 1750 pound force times two feet. The 5500 is positive because it's counterclockwise. Distance from the 5,500 pound force to point A is six feet. And last but not least, the 3,500 pound force causes a positive moment counterclockwise. And that distance there is 14 feet plus six feet, which is 20 feet. Solving this out for D, D equals 9.26 feet. That is where the line of action of the resultant force is from point D. I'm sorry, it's from point A. Let's take a look at another problem. Problem 390. Here it says replace the three forces acting on the shaft by a single resultant force. Specify what the force acts measured from in B. This is in B. This is in A. Let's see, we have a five. Hundred pound force. This is a three four five slope triangle. We have a two hundred pound force, and we have a two sixty pound force. And this is a twenty 
12, 13, 5. This is here. Make this a little neater. Is four feet. Distance here is two feet. Distance here is three feet. Distance here is five feet. And they want to replace this system of forces with a single resultant force. All right, so the X component of my resultant force is the sum of all my forces in the X direction. So the 500 pound force extends in the negative X direction. So that's negative 500 pound force times the four fifths slope triangle ratio plus the 260 pound force times the five thirteenths slope triangle ratio. This gives you negative 300 pound force. For the Y component of my resultant force, it's the sum of all my forces in the Y direction. So that is equal to the, all these are in the negative Y direction. Let's state that up front. So that's five, negative 500 pound force times the three fifths slope triangle ratio minus the 200 pound force minus the 260 pound force times 12 thirteenths ratio. So the Y component of my resultant force is equal to minus 740 pound force. Now, We we know we looking at the problem image or problem the shaft the resultant force we have the x component of the resultant force and y component all right let's redraw that a little bit the x component. We'll say it here. This is A, B. It's the Y component of the resultant force and the X component of the resultant force. The X component then, the line of action passes through point A. So if the line of action will force passing through the point you're trying to cause a moment about, then it cause no, causes no moment because there's no perpendicular distance separating the line of action from the point. FRY, the Y component then, does have a perpendicular distance between its line of action and point A. So in this case, we're only concerned about the Y component of the resultant force. So, I'm sorry, not point A, point B. Same argument. X component passes through point B. So no line of no moment about point B caused by the X component, but the Y component, there's a perpendicular distance. So about point B, the resultant moment about point B is the sum of all the individual moments caused by the individual forces about point B. Go to a fresh page. So like we said, we're only concerned about the Y component of the resultant force. 
740 pound force and it's some distance from point B. Also, we know that it's po point B is here and it's the Y component or even from the original image. The resultant force is say some distance here and the distance from there to B, D, is applied, is applied in a, neg a negative Y direction or vertical direction pointed down from point B. So it's going to cause a counterclockwise or positive moment about point B. So that's 740 pound force times the distance D. Now the individual moments caused by the individual forces about point B. They are all going to be positive because they are all to the left of point B. So it's counterclockwise rotation they're tending to cause. So for the 500 pound force, the vertical component is three fifths, slope triangle ratio, times the perpendicular distance to point B. That's three plus two feet, five feet, plus four feet, which just gives you nine feet. Plus the 200 pound force, times the vertical um, perpendicular distance, which is two feet plus four feet, which is six feet, plus the 260 pound force, times the, which is the vertical component, would be 12 thirteenths, slope triangle ratio, times the perpendicular distance to point B, which is four feet. Sum all that up and divide by the 740 pound force to get D, you get D is 6.57 feet. That is where the resultant force is applied. Let's do one in three dimensional space. Look at um, problem 3-98 on page This is my Z axis, Y axis, X axis. The problem says replace the parallel force system acting on the plate by resultant force and specifies location in the X Z plane. Okay, so we have three forces all in the, with their sense of the forces in the negative Y direction. So we have a two kilonewton force a five kilonewton force and a three kilonewton force. This is 0 0.5 meters. This is one meter this is one meter this is one meter this is 0.5 meters okay now all these forces, their sense act in the Y direction, but the negative Y direction. So the resultant force is the sum of all my forces in the Y direction. So that is, and they all in the negative Y direction, so it's 
like the five kilonewtons minus two kilonewtons minus three kilonewtons minus 10 kilonewtons. So now the question asked us to replace these three forces with a resultant force that specifies location in the XY plane. So these forces are causing a moment about both the X axis and Z axis. This is three dimensional space. So, the resultant moment about the x-axis is the sum of all the moments caused by the forces about the x-axis. Okay, so once again, the only thing we have is force time perpendicular distance. And in, about the x-axis, since they're pointing in negative y direction, that rotation is going, if you look along the x-axis, it will be a counterclockwise rotation, so positive. The rotation is causing about the z-axis would be a negative rotation because this way would be positive and this way it's negative by our sense. So it's causing a negative direction rotation about the Z axis, but a positive one about the Y axis. So working the, I'm sorry, about the X axis. So working the, um, and since the force is all in the Y direction, they cause no rotation about the Y axis. So working the moments about the X axis first, our resultant force, remember we said that x-axis rotation is positive, so that's the 10 kilonewton resultant force times some distance. So the question is asking then where, we want to know the, the coordinates in the x and z plane that the resultant force is applied. So it's going to be somewhere here, we'll just say. So how far up in the z direction from the x axis is it and how far in the x x x direction is it from the z axis that's what the question is asking us so we take our moments about the x axis is some distance z vertical from the x axis that the resultant force is applied so then the individual, now we have to determine the individual moments caused by the individual forces about the x-axis. Well, the three kilonewton force, once again, all these are positive about the x-axis. What's the perpendicular distance from the three kilonewton force to the x-axis? That's 0 0.5 meters. All right. Plus the two kilonewton force. The perpendicular distance is the 0 0.5 meters plus the one meter plus to one meter, so it's 2.5 meters. Last but not least, the five kilonewton force, the perpendicular distance to the X axis is the 0.5 meters plus to one meter. So that's 1.5 meters. Solve for Z, it gives you 1.40 meters. So that resultant force is a vertical distance from the X axis of 1.4 meters. Now for the Z axis, We want to know the distance in the x direction that the resultant force is applied from the z axis. Okay. So once again, we said the z axis is going to be causing a negative direction rotation. So here everything is um, negative. So it's negative resultant force, 10 kilonewtons times some distance x, which we were trying to, solve, trying to solve. The three kilonewton force, negative. What's the perpendicular distance from that to the z-axis? Well, it is the 0.5 meters plus the one meter. 
so that's 1.5 meters. Minus the, let's do the 2 kilonewton force next. The perpendicular distance from that to the z axis is the 1 meter plus the 0.5 meters, so 1.5 meters. Last but not least, the 5 kilonewton force, the perpendicular distance to the z axis is 0.5 meters. Solve for x, you get 1 meter. So the resultant force in the xz plane is applied from the origin, one meter in the positive x direction and 1.4 meters in the positive z direction. Okay, so let's talk about section 3.9, distributed loadings. <clears throat> so sometimes bodies in our study of statics subject to loadings which are basically forces that are distributed over the surface of the body. For example, say water in a tank, wind across the face of a sign, etc. So the pressure caused by the loading at each point represents the intensity of the loading. So intensity of the loading is equal to the pressure caused by the loading at each point on this surface. This distributed loadings can be represented by a resultant force. Where the magnitude of the resultant force is equal to the area under the loading diagram. Where the mag where the uh, resultant force is located let me say that better. The resultant force is located at the geometric center or centroid.
of the area under the loading diagram. Loading diagrams and this text take the shape of say not circles, rectangles, triangles. Etc., or some combination. We can find these Appendix B, which in the text is on page eight hundred and um, eight fourteen through eight fifteen. Um, gives the centroid location of different geometric shapes. For example, centroid of a rectangular area is in the center and the area is given by base times height, centroid of a triangle, and I'm from appendix B, triangular area is Draw a triangle for you. Ah, Base height centroid. I like to say the centroid is located a third from the large, larger side of the triangular area. Key word here is a third. So let's take a look at a problem. Example 3.22 in your text. This is page. 146. <clears throat> Here, we're given a distributed loading of P X over the top surface of the beam shown, determine the magnitude and location of an equivalent resultant force. So here we have a thickness of this beam. Zero point two meters. And we know the strip load is given in pascals. Pascals is units of Newton per meter squared. 
So the, the distributed loading, 800 X Newton per meter squared, but is uniform along the width of the beam given by the Y axis here. So we can represent this in 2D as times the thickness or the width, 0 0.2 meters, which gives you 160 X Newtons per meters. So now we can look at it in 2D. So let's rewrite this out. We have a beam and we have the loading on it. The length here is nine meters. This is the beam. And the loading intensity we said is when X is measured from the left to the right so when x is equal to 1, the um, intensity is 160 times 1. When x is equal to 2, the intensity is 160 times 2. When x equals 3 meters, the intensity is 160 times 3. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, 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 the loading force is 160 times the distance x. So that would be, for example, let's do that again. When x equals 1, then loading equals 160 times 1 was 160 newtons per meters times one meter gives you 160 newtons. When X equals two meters, the loading equals 160 newtons per meter times two meters gives you 320 newtons and so on and so forth. So the length of the beam is nine meters. So when X equals nine meters, the loading equals 160 newton per meter times 9 meters gives you 1440 newtons. So this intensity at the top here it's given by, and as you can see, the triangular shape is telling you that when the distance from, we'll just call this point A, and we'll call it the point B just to make it easier to understand. The, the, as the distance from point A to point B gets larger, the intensity of the loading increases to a maximum of 1,440 newtons per meter. So we said then that the resultant force is equal to the area of the geometric shape. In this case, it is a triangle, right? So from Appendix B, for a triangle, area equals to one half base times the height. So in this case, base is nine meters, height is the loading intensity, which is 1440 newtons per meter. So then my resultant force is one half times the base, nine meters, times the height, which is the loading intensity, 1440 newton per meter. Meters cross out, 
believe in you Newtons. And then we set the line of action of the resultant force passes through the centroid of the geometric shape. So here, when we said it'd be one third from the way I like to give a clue is say from this large side of the triangle or the high side. So that centroid then is here. Well, in the x direction, that's one third of nine meters. So that's six meters from the left is where the resultant force is applied. Resultant force is applied here. And that would be one third of nine. So six meters from the left. We've got a couple problems. Take a look at problem 3-109, page 149. Here it says, replace the distributed loading with an equivalent resultant force and specify its location on the beam measured from point O. is the beam. Intensity of the loading given by three kilo of the distributed loading, three kilonewtons per meter. This is my point O. This distance here is three meters. This is 1.5 meters. So we can represent this as two right triangles. So the resultant force is the area under the curve. So we have, we'll call it right triangle one and right triangle two. So the area for right triangle one is half the base, three meters times the height, which is the intensity, three kilonewton per meter, plus the area of right triangle two, which is one half the base, 1.5 meters times the height, which is once again, three kilonewtons per meter. My resultant force, sum those two together, you get 6.75 kilonewtons. And that is projected down, we'll say somewhere right here. The problem asks us to 
determine its location. So we're going to combine some of our previous concepts here. So we take the moment, result moment about point O, O here, is equal to the sum of the individual moments of the forces caused about point O. So my resultant force is some distance, we'll call it D from point O, and we're trying to find that. So since this is causing it clockwise, it'd be negative moment about point O times some distance D. And the individual moments will be the resultant forces of each individual right triangle times its perpendicular distance from point O. Both of those will be negative because they're both causing a clockwise rotation about point O. So for right triangle one, once again, the resultant force here is the half the base three meters times the height, which is the intensity, three kilonewtons per meter. So that's my resultant force for right triangle one. And that's applied, remember he said, a third from the large side. So that one will be applied, let's do it in a different color. So that it will be applied here. We'll say right triangle one resultant force Remember, centroid, so a third, so that would be two meters. A third of three meters is one meter, so that's two meters from the left is where that is applied. So then a perpendicular distance from the resultant force from right triangle one to point O is two meters. Remember, this is negative because it's clockwise. And for right triangle two, once again, that's one half the base, which is 1.5 meters times the height, which is the intensity of the loading, three kilonewtons per meter. Now here, once again, on the large side is a third where the resultant force is applied, the centroid. So a third of 1.5 is 0 0.5, but on the large side, so that'd be here, 0 0.5. So the total distance then from the centroid of right triangle 2 to point O will be the 3 meters plus the 0 0.5, which will give you 3.5 meters. Multiply that out and solve for D, you get 2.5 meters. And that's where the overall resultant force of the distributed loading is applied. Let's do another problem. Look at problem 310 on the same page, page 149. Here it says, replace the, the loading by an equivalent resultant force and specify its location on the beam measured from A. So we have our beam. We can model this loading as a rectangle plus a triangle. The best key is always to simplify your shapes to make your problem easier. Intensity here is given by two kilonewtons per meter. And here it's given by five kilonewtons per meter. Point B, and this is point A. This is four meters. And this is two meters. All right, so we have simplified our shapes. Remember, the resultant force is the area of the geometric shape. 
So here we've simplified it into a rectangle and a triangle. So the area of the rectangle is base times height, base being four plus two, which is six meters. So my resultant force is the area under the curve, or I'm sorry, the area under the loading. So for the rectangular, rectangle, the area is the six meters base times the height, in this case, which is the two kilonewton per meter. Right? Two kilonewtons per meter. Now for the triangle, we said it's one half the base times the height. So that would be one half the base, which is still six meters, right? This base is still six meters. But the height now is not five, but it's five minus two. If this is two kilonewtons per meter, then the height of just the triangle area or the intensity is the five minus the two. So three kilonewtons per meter. Solve that up. And realizing that the um, this is in the negative y direction, so the resultant force is negative, you get, um, multiply this out, you get about 21 kilonewtons. All right. Now, the problem asking us to replace this um, loading with the equivalent resultant force, which we have done, and then specifies location on the beam measured from A. So, once again, the resultant moment about point A from our resultant force is equal to the individual moments about point A caused by the individual forces. Well, we know, a different color. The resultant force, we say, is somewhere here. So it's applied to the right of A, which would be clockwise rotation about point A, which would be negative. So, and that distance from point A, we'll call that distance D. So the negative 21 kilonewtons times D, and the individual forces of the loading, so the individual areas. If we take again the rectangle, rectangular area, we says base times height, so that's, and remember it's in the negative, it's called, it's called a clockwise, so it'll be negative moment. So that's six uh, meters times the height, two kilonewton meters. And remember for a rectangle, centroid, let's see, Centroid from appendix B is center. So if this length is six meters, the centroid will be applied at three meters in the horizontal direction. So the perpendicular distance from that resultant force of the rectangle to point A is the center, which is B. If the total length is six meters, the center would be three meters. So the perpendicular distance is three meters. For the triangle, this is a negative clockwise moment, right? So it's one half the base. Once again, this is six meters, as we did earlier, times the three kilonewtons per meter. And like we said here, it's always on the third, on the large side, centroid. Applied at one third, we'll say on the large side. Just a little clue here. So if the total length is six meters, then it is applied. A third from six is two. So two meters from the right will give us four meters from the left. 
So the perpendicular distance to point A will be four meters. Multiply it out and solve for D. You get D equals 3.43 meters. So that pretty much concludes our work in chapter three. Just go and take a look at chapter four. Get a little headway there. Equilibrium of a rigid body. So here, in this chapter primarily, we'll be working with equations of equilibrium and working on our free body diagrams. So what do we mean by equilibrium? Here we said that a body is at rest or will move with constant velocity. which means mathematically that the sum of all the forces acting on the body is zero and The sum of all the moments of all forces in the system about point, say O, added to all the couple moments. equal to zero. So basically for equilibrium, the sum of all our forces, we've set it to zero, and all the sum of all our moments are equal to zero. And we said a body's at rest or will have constant velocity. So if the body is already at rest and the impact of all your forces is equal to zero, the body will stay at rest. And if the body is moving at constant velocity, and the impact of all the forces on this body is equal to zero, then the body will continue, will continue to move in that same direction with that same velocity. So it's an equilibrium. <clears throat> These are requirements. Let me make that, let me make that clear. Next page. It's just requirements for equilibrium. Which means this must be true if you have equilibrium. Must be true. So once again, sum of all your forces equal to zero. And the resultant moment, sum of all your moments in the system is equal to zero. So to apply the equations 
of equilibrium. We must specify all known I guess and unknown external forces that act on a body. And the best way to do this is a free body diagram. <sighs> on this sketch, FBD, abbreviated free body diagram, you must show all forces and couple moments that the supports and the surroundings exert on the body. All right, support reactions. This is extremely important in constructing our free body diagrams and continuing our work in statics. So we have to be very familiar and fluid with different support reactions. Looking at them, converting them to forces and or moments, and then actually understanding what they mean. So, a support prevents the translation of a body by exerting a force on the body. And what I mean here is translation will say prevent movement in the X, Y, and three-dimensional space Z directions. A support prevents the rotation of a body by exerting a couple moment on the body. So then at page 159 in your text, section 4.2. So for a beam, <clears throat> if it's on a roller, then instead of working our free body diagram, we'll convert that to beam showing a force in a vertical direction. Now, what I mean by that is the roller, hence the name roller, that beam is free to move in the X direction, either way. However, since it's resting on top of the roller, it cannot move in the Y direction. Roller prevents movement in vertical direction, but allows, we'll say, we'll say allow, let's say, does not prevent, but does not prevent movement 
in horizontal direction. So we replace the roller with the force that prevents this movement. So we said it prevents movement in the vertical direction. So then that means there has to be a force there that's holding up the beam in the vertical direction. Likewise for a pin. So a pin passes through a hole in the beam and is fixed to the ground. So for a pen's sake, it's supporting it in the Y direction, supports beam in Y direction, and since it's pinned, it prevents movement in the X direction as well. However, since it's pinned, the beam is free to rotate. So we will replace that pin since it prevents it in the, or it prevents moving in the Y direction. There's a Y component of the force and it prevents moving in the X direction. There's an X component of force. So in our free body diagram, we have replaced the pin with its with the equivalent forces. There's an Y is a vertical component of the force and a horizontal component of the force because the pin does not allow movement in the vertical and horizontal directions. That's the way to look at it. So then for a fixed support, Fixed supports prevents translation in both directions and prevents rotation of the beam. Therefore, we will replace the fixed support with a vertical force component, since it's holding up the beam, preventing it from going down in the Y direction, so there's a force there. There's a X component, horizontal component to the force, because it's preventing movement of the beam in the horizontal direction, or X direction. And since there's preventing rotation as well, that support applies a moment. Remember, moment is the tendency for a body to rotate about a point, and the fixed support is preventing rotation, then it, there must be a moment component of that fixed support. So what we're doing is taking these individual supports and replacing them with what they mean in a force perspective. Now, how do we know this? Well, pages 160 to 161 in the text which is table 4-1, supports for rigid bodies and two-dimensional space. So we have cables, links, rollers, rockers, etc. So you have to become very familiar with this table, what it means, how it makes sense as we work through. Let's talk about springs. In this case, linear elastic springs.
the spring constant k defines the elasticity of the spring. So the magnitude of the force developed by a linear elastic spring with stiffness K and is elongated a distance S is given by the relationship and S is equal to L minus LO where L is the deformed length and LO is this initial length. Let's take a look at a problem. Problem 4-1 on page 179. It says, determine the components of the support reactions at the fixed support A on the cantilever beam. So they told us A is a fixed support. Six kilonewton force here. And we have a four kilonewton force here. This angle here is thirty degrees. length is 1.5 meters. This is 1.5 meters. 1.5 meters. Okay. So we have to use our equations of equilibrium which are Sum of our forces equal to zero in the x direction, sum of our forces equal to zero in the y direction, and sum of our moments equal to zero. These are requirements for equilibrium. So for our free body diagram, we said it was a fixed support at A. Well, going through our table 4-1 on page 160, one, a fixed support has a moment and a y and x direction forces, three unknowns. So instead of drawing that fixed support, I'm going to replace it with its um, support reaction forces. So there's an FY, there's an FX, and there is a moment here. Called, these are all the reactions caused by the fixed support. So now I have three unknowns to solve for. Fx, Fy, and Ma. Let me, let me call that a little bit different. Call it Ax and then Ay, so it makes it clear. So, 
the sum of forces in the x direction must equal zero. So I have a four kilonewton force that has an x component, which would be cosine of this angle. So we have four kilonewtons times cosine of 30 minus ax equals zero. Ax is in the negative direction because if, if it was facing to the right and positive, then this could not give me zero. It has to be negative so that the result is zero, which is, gives us equilibrium. Solving for this, Ax is equal to four times cosine 30, 3.46 uh, kilonewtons. So my Ay, Some of our forces in the y direction must be equal to zero. These are requirements for equilibrium. Requirements for equilibrium. So then I have an Ay minus six kilonewtons minus four kilonewtons times sine of 30 degrees. And set it to equal zero. Solving for Ay, you get Ay equal to Put the six kilonewtons and the four times sine 30 on the other side of the equal sign. Ay is equal to eight kilonewtons. Last but not least, we have to solve for our moment about point A. We have to set that to equal zero as a requirement of equilibrium. So then we have our moment at about point A, which is the unknown here, which we have to solve for. The six kilonewton causes a clockwise negative moment about point A. So it's minus six kilonewtons times the perpendicular distance, 1.5 meters. The four kilonewton has the horizontal and vertical components both cause a moment about point A. So for the horizontal component, that's a negative moment. So that's minus four kilonewtons times cosine of 30. The perpendicular distance is, they gave you the length here and the angle. So that would be 1.5 times sine of 30 to get the perpendicular distance. Minus the vertical component here. So it's a four kilonewtons times sine of 30. And the horizontal distance there is the three meters plus the 1.5 cosine of 30 degrees. Set that equal to zero, solve for the moment about point A, you get 20.2 kilonewton meters. So we'll stop here this evening. Um, please email me if you have any questions um, and have a good rest of your day.